Now, this lesson is following on from the uh, Andover Scandal lesson. And it's focusing very much on how the development of charity and self-help occurred over time. Now, based on what we did last lesson, the Andover scandal was a big turning point in the attitudes towards the poor in England. The poor in England were obviously treated well, pretty horrendously. And after the Amendment Act of 1834, you can argue that the treatment didn't get any better. If anything, it became more limited because of the impact of the workhouses. So what we need to do with this lesson is to do three things. Firstly, look at what charity and self-help actually means. We have looked at self-help in a previous lesson. Then we need to explain how the trend of charity and self-help grew for the paupers of England. And remember, the paupers were the ones that relied on poor relief. And then evaluate how much life changed for the poor. So obviously look at how, how charity and self-help actually changed the poor. Or did it in fact only change because of the selfish motive of a group of individuals? So, first of all, this question that we looked at last time, I had some great responses from the Andover scandal part. I'm going to do the same with this lesson, looking at how charity and self-help evidenced a more positive concern for the well-being of the poor. And just remember this. Poor relief is something that makes the concept of pauperism and poverty easier. It's a relief. It's basically something that makes their life a little bit easier in the short term. In the eyes of some people, things like the workhouses made life easier. But as that condition began to change, then we realised that actually the, the whole problem needed to be dealt with. Paupers away so they can go into a, a life of obscurity in the workhouses. So how did charitable philanthropic activity develop? We're going to look at three factors. There's a few questions we've got to consider when we do this. First of all, the role of the middle class. Now, with the middle class, we've got to remember one thing, OK, because this course overlaps. We've got to remember that by 1834, the middle class had begun to gain a position in society. Because of the 1832 Great Reform Act, the middle class had the vote, which means they had a higher status in society. So their role was very important in the long run. We also need to look at the issue of outdoor relief and the changing attitudes. Um, outdoor relief was something that well, the government really wanted to get rid of, but every time they tried to get rid of it, there was all they always faced this barrage of opposition, mainly because relief was a cheaper alternative to the workhouses that the people really wanted, you know, the parishes would prefer to use. And then you've also got something slightly different in the role of women. Now, the role of women was very minimal in this time period, sort of 1785 to 18, 1870. It was very minimal. But this opportunity to help paupers really put women's rights on the map in our country and some argue it was the beginning of a very subtle suffragette movement so i'm going to go through each one of these then there's some questions to answer i will try my best to give you the answer in as much depth as possible so the first we're going to look at is the role of the middle class now again there's a lot of text here so i'm going to go through it a bit slowly and underline the key points now, following the Amendment Act, I remember the Amendment Act was in 1834, an issue such as the Andover scandal, Andover scandal is what we looked at last lesson um, in the really poor treatment. Now, one of the questions you have is give four reasons why the Andover scandal caused people to change their approach to the poor. Basically, what we're saying there is what did the Andover scandal do to have an impact? on people's attitudes and what we're looking at there straight away is the poor treatment so in terms of the andover uh, andover scandal you can definitely refer to the bone the bone crushing the starvation you could talk about the, the poor mistreatment in terms of extra food you can also in terms of that why the andover scandal caused people to change their approach so the middle class changed their attitudes 
and had more of a the paternalistic attitude came back to a degree. You could also mention in terms of how the Andover scandal caused people to change their approach to the poor, you could, it made people realise the severity of the workhouses, how they weren't being checked properly. Hence the dissolution of the poor commission. Okay. Now, which there's lots more things there. You just need to focus here on the bad things about the Andover scandal. So how did the Andover scandal change people's approach to the poor? If anything, it had uh, one more thing. It made them feel more sympathy to the individuals of the workhouse. So, going on a bit further. So obviously I've, I've answered number one for you. I mean, I want to go answer these questions as we go. So. If I miss anything, obviously that's for you to look through your revision notes as well. There was a significant change towards a more socially responsible approach to poverty. What does that actually mean? Well, socially responsible means it's the job of the people to help people less who aren't as well off as others. And this basically means that England has a paternalistic approach. So if we try and break it down, 1785 to 1834, there was a mixture of responsibility and punishment. You had the poor houses, you had, uh, you had the outdoor relief, you had some aspects of help with things like new land art, the beginning of the cooperative movement. 1834 to 1846 was a punishment. After the Amendment Act, pauperism was seen as a crime, and the attitude was it was idleness that got you into that situation. In 1846 onwards, we went back to that paternalistic attitude that we must help one another. The charitable ventures that were set up in this time period, so following 1846, were actually set up by middle class men whose social conscience motivated them to help the less fortunate. But who set up the most charitable causes? It might surprise some people, but it was the middle class. The middle class, and they did this for a number of reasons. If we carry on reading, it says, in part, they shared, they shared the same fear of instability if the poor continued to ground down. For one reason why the middle class did it, is they were fearful of what would happen if the poor got poorer. Would they revolt? Would they cause more issues? That's one reason why. The, the middle class got involved okay but that was a minority the main reason why the middle class got involved is the fact that with their prosperity so with their increased status then what happened was is that they developed this attitude of well meaning they wanted to help basically um and another reason why is that there was this concept of Christian charity. Now, I'll go back to this in a minute, but it says here, however, they did have some attitudes of well-meaning, which prosperity brought sometimes. The growth in the power and the wealth of the middle class led to a rise in stronger feeling of Christian charity, which informed the newfound interest of the poor. So basically, they felt it was their duty to help people in need, and individuals who were really struggling. Because remember, if you were a pauper, it was really difficult to get out of the, out of the situation. Hence why a lot of people say that people that went to the, the workhouses were there for life. It was a prison for the poor. How is charity work going to be conducted? Now, it says here, the activities of these people, so the activities of the middle class, centred on charity work being organised with the intention of finding out what the poor needed to help with their needs. So I think our, our idea of charity is a bit different. The idea of charity that the middle class wants to do is to find out, investigate what the poor needed to make their lives better. And then 
this could lead to further support for the poor in the long run. So it was about char the charity work was about finding out what they needed, basically putting up a developing the situation to get a backdrop, get an understanding. Once they had that understanding, then they could help further. Why may the concept of charity be a good thing for the poor of England? Now, at the end of the day, charity it allows the poor people of England to express what they needed to allow them to develop their own well-being with the help of people who had the power to do it. That's the most important thing there is that the middle class people had the power to do it. They wouldn't really want guidance from people with much higher status. Hopefully it means that the poor would be given And because now we've got to this point where after the Andover scandal, you know, some of the boards, you know, the poor boards commission, the poor law commission got dissolved. We've now got we've now got individuals that might be able to help a little bit further. So that's the first factor, the role of the middle class. The issue of outdoor relief and changing attitudes. So, overall, outdoor relief formally ended the able-bodied in 1844. Now, again, this causes problems. So the government tried to formally end it in 1844. Now, by able-bodied, remember, you've got the deserving poor, were ill, elderly, infirm and the undeserving poor. These are people who were deemed they could work. Okay. Now, since 1834, the government wanted to end reliance on this form of relief, but it was still used due to opposition. As I've mentioned, parishes really didn't want to let this go. The parishes found this form of relief the most effective as it was less harsh than the workhouse regime. And believe it or not, it was much cheaper. So they did not want to remove a cheap form of poor relief. Now, the reason outdoor relief was popular because it was a temporary fix for the worker. Now, in a time of recession, people might lose their jobs. So what happened was, is that if you were an able-bodied man and you were out of work through a recession, the recession was going to end. But if the able-bodied man went into a workhouse, they might not come out. But it wasn't the most practical thing to do. If you're just putting an able-bodied individual into a workhouse, realistically, is that fair? So this is when the outdoor labour test order was passed, which basically exempted, exempted those individuals and allowed them to have outdoor relief. So any able-bodied man who lost their job in a time of recession, because of the outdoor labour test order, they, they did not have to go into a workhouse. They were allowed to continue to have outdoor relief. Now, but, but by the mid 1840s, all this opposition really did go down. So outdoor relief, again, was restricted to the ill or the infirm. So infirm, you're sort of talking about individuals that have mental health problems, that might be quite mad. That, again, is going to cause a few problems. OK, the government are subtly trying to remove outdoor relief. So by 1852, the Outdoor Relief Regulation Order was passed, which limited the above provision. So basically what this did, the Outdoor Relief Regulation Order, was it got rid of the outdoor relief, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the outdoor relief for the ill and the infirm. So it's taking it one step further. OK, so infirm people, people that may struggle with everyday needs, the ill people who physically cannot work that's going to cause significant opposition. The restrictions in 1852 led to protests by boards of guardians who felt that the powers were being reduced by the state. All of the policies were rescinded and outdoor relief went back to the most common form of relief for the rest of the century. So because of the, uh, the protests by the boards of guardian, 
the, the state backed down and then they introduced outdoor relief again. Now, why did they keep trying to get rid of outdoor relief? Well, it's really simple. Because of the 1834 Amendment Act, it says here, the measures that were rescinded was an attempt to enforce the Amendment Act. So the reason why they tried to get rid of outdoor relief was because in the 1834 Amendment Act, they actually wanted to do that. But it was also trying to enforce the concept of self-help. Okay. Now, most individuals believe that poverty was down to individual responsibility and self-help, the idea that personal commitment would lead to success. What the state believes is if they removed outdoor relief, people would self-help themselves and try and get better, and it would lead to success without them relying on the state. Now, the difference by the 1850s was that the negative view of paupers led to a more proactive attitude. So rather than attacking them, because of all these changes to outdoor relief, instead of just attacking paupers, people were thinking about how to help them. So rather than simple punishment, those in need could be helped to help themselves. And therefore new charities emerged, sought to provide the means for achieving this. And we're gonna look at a group um, in a bit called the COS. They really helped with self-help, okay? And we're gonna develop that a bit more shortly. So. The answers. We'll go through a few of these to help you out uh, and we'll type them as we go. So the first ones, I'll do it on the next slide when there's some more room. Define the following terms. You've got outdoor relief, outdoor labour test order, infirm, outdoor relief regulation order, boards of guardian and state. So first of all, outdoor relief. Got this by now. It's basically a type of poor relief, um, which you got money, money, you got goods. Okay. Now I'm just going to take this one step further. It was the more popular method of relief. It was cheaper than the workhouses which made it very popular for parishes because they wanted to limit costs so that costs were lower for the ratepayer. Okay, so there's that understanding there of outdoor relief. The next one, outdoor labour test. That was similar to passed in 1842. It allowed the use of poor relief for the able-bodied poor. It prevented them from going into a workhouse. That was the main thing. The reason why that this one got passed is because there was a lot of opposition to um, taking uh, poor relief off able-bodied men in a time of recession, because they can't really be helped. Why should the state punish someone for something that they might have put them, uh, actually put them through? Now, infirm, many different reasons, uh, definitions here. It can be um, someone who is weak through age, illness, or mental capacity. Um, again, you've probably heard of infirmaries. That's, again, something that was quite popular in these days in terms of making sure that people who were infirm did get the help. But the outdoor relief regulation that was in 1852, and it tried to prevent outdoor relief for the most vulnerable people in society. That caused a lot of uproar. It caused a lot of problems because they were supposed, well, they were seen as the deserving poor. Okay. Now, boards of guardian, they were basically groups who were created after the Amendment Act. And their job was to oversee the treatment of the poor, to ensure fairness and clarity in their treatment. Okay. And then the last one, state. I mean, this is, um, when we talk about the state in this course, we're talking 
about the government. Okay, if, if I say, oh, you know, the, the state wanted to remove this, we're talking about the government. Now, why were parishes not wanting to remove outdoor relief? Well, this is again very simplistic. The outdoor relief was very effective. It was fair. It was much cheaper than the workhouses. And it was seen as more of a temporary fix, which allowed some people to get back on their feet, unlike the workhouses. Okay, so that's really important. Why did the government try to remove outdoor relief? There's two reasons why the government actually tried to do it. The government was unsure about whether outdoor relief was a good method to self-help. Did paupers become too reliant on the system? That's one thing you could consider. And the government were also worried about the overall cost of outdoor relief. They believe that the workhouses in some places were easier to deal with the problem of paupers. Which again, are they dealing with the problem of pauperism or are they just removing into a workhouse that's considered as an, as an easier alternative? No. How does this charitable thinking. So how did the concept of outdoor relief impact charitable thinking? And the way the government viewed outdoor relief, it changed the public's attitude on the poor. There were protests by the boards of Guardian after the 1852 Act tried to restrict relief for the ill and infirm. In regard to charitable thinking, just go back to the last slide. Um, it says here, the difference was that negative view of poor led to a more proactive attitude. So what you could say is, is that the outdoor relief changed people's opinions. Instead of punishing the poor, there was that proactivity. And it is quite difficult to get your head around straight off, but it's very clear to understand. The overall changing in outdoor relief means that people wanted to get involved. We're, we're evolving as a society in the 1840s and 50s, and we got a clear outline that people wanted to help, okay? Now, factor three, the role of women. Now, what we need to understand, as I mentioned, there was very, you know, women had very little status in society um, during the Victorian period, and there's this Victorian woman. The charitable causes allowed for women to become involved in public affairs. People look past this. Like their role in society in causing change was very limited due to their gender. And getting involved in poor relief gave them that platform to develop the way they, they thought. Now, the role that was taken by women, third bullet point here, also helped them with their own long term campaign for greater recognition in society, contributing towards their political acceptance after 1918. Now, in the 1850s, Women got involved in charity as it was their way of gaining a higher place in society. And one of the most important women was Angela Burdett Coots. She had an interest in raising opportunities for pauper children by finding them jobs in the military. She also co-founded with Charles Dickens a hostel for poor women who turned to prostitution. And she also funded education for the poorest children. This was a way, this basically sums up everything we've looked at. And it all comes down to, I personally think, one thing. The reason why the attitude to the poor were changing and the reason why charity and self-help developed very significantly this time is because 
people's attitudes changed hugely. Without this change in attitude, I think it could be really difficult for the concept of poverty to change at all. Now, I'm not going to go through the answers there because I think it's quite common sense. Did, did women get involved to mainly benefit themselves? I mean, you could say yes, but that's a very cynical way of looking at it. How did Angela Burdett Coots um, help poor relief? I mean, the fourth bullet point there really does sum it up. But women were changing. There was, there was more of a, people thought that the maternal instincts of a woman very much suited the treatment of the poor. So, I mean, we're gonna look at a few individuals in the next lesson and really take this one step further. But it really did focus on change and it really did. They had, women had a significant role to play the development of treatment to, towards the poor especially in terms of charity and um, you know this, this last bullet point here is very much focused on charitable aspects now again this is um, just a few examples of charitable activity that happened and explained how it would help but there isn't a massive amount that you could talk about okay in terms of charity it does link to the attitudes so I'm just going to read the four that we've got here and your job is to explain how it would help. I'll put a couple of bits there just to help you, but it really, again, this is about the analysis in an essay. Which one of these is the most important charity, uh, charitable act? And then we'll look at self-help before um, finishing the lesson. So first activity, collecting statistics from individuals who found themselves in poverty. Groups such as the Workhouse Visiting Society collected information on the experiences of the poor. And that might not seem like a charitable activity, but people are giving up their time to find out stuff about the poor. So why is collecting statistics from individuals good? Well, the first thing you could say by finding out the problems, they can be dealt with. Another thing you could say is that by having a workhouse visiting society, it's more of an informal checkup on the workhouses. There'll be no repeat of Andover or Huddersfield. And another thing, I mean, third thing you could say, collecting statistics from indiv individuals, it gives the poor a voice to air their concerns which is something they might not feel like they've ever had before. So it could be really important to actually give the individuals a voice for themselves. In 1865, the medical journal, The Lancet, which you probably remember very much less at the time, undertook an investigation into the quality of medical care in London workhouses and the findings led to the Metropolitan Poor Act of 1867. It said that medical facilities were separate from the workhouse and that uh, Metropolitan Asylum Board took over medical care. Now, once again, this is finding out what is wrong. The key thing here is it led to a huge change in the medical well-being of the poor. Now, look, we need to be real about this. Could you just, well, workhouse is going to disappear overnight? No, 100%. Workhouses were not going to disappear. Um, they was, it was still a huge problem, okay. um, but it was a way of dealing with a significant group of people who were very, at the, you know, at the bottom of society that really struggled. But by introducing the Metropolitan Poor Act, so the MPA of 1867, it allowed better medical care, which means that the paupers were treated on equal par as other members of society. Now, again, it might not seem like a charitable activity, but this concept of charitable activity is very different to what we'd have today, like food banks or we're going to take our old clothes down to a charity shop. This was helping, helping find out what was wrong, leading to change. Actually talking to the paupers rather than locking them away in the workhouses. It allows there to be a breadth in understanding. It allows paupers to say what is wrong and for their and for the new attitudes of society to be proactive in how they change the society as a whole 
And then individuals such as Angela Burdett Coot, educating children. I mean, that straight away, that's more of a hands on charitable activity. She is focused on giving individuals a new, uh, a new start in life, that's better, in life. Now, there was criticism in this because some people thought it was handing help on a plate, which encourages them to not seek help themselves. So again, charity, there was some criticism towards it because of the fact that if you're given stuff and given stuff and given stuff, it might just make you become reliant. Okay, But if you're expected to do things on your own, that's where you step up and go, all right, I better now do this. So, two more bits. We're going to look at self-help. We're going to look at the cause, who I spoke about previously, and then look at a practice response that I expect you to do. And then um, I'll briefly go through um, some of the homework. Now, self-help, the cause. Now, the self-help wasn't a new idea. We talked about it before. The concept of self-help in the eyes of the state meant that they weren't, that paupers weren't going to be reliant and encouraged them to be part of going to a shop. So the concept of self-help was being put in the 1860s when an idea was developed into the industrialization of the country, which saw entrepreneurial men, so basically businessmen, make lots of money with their own effort. And because rich men made money on their own, they thought that poor people could make money on their own if they just tried that. Now, the re-emphasis of self-help was normal. But when it comes to a high level of pauperism, the idea, and this is important, that paupers should help themselves and not rely on the state, not get any poor relief, not get any help whatsoever. Which, after the Andover scandal, had a few more sense of responsibility. The main aspect of this idea was seen in the Charity Organisation Society, the POS. Now, the Charity Organisation Society was formed in 1869. And the purpose was to distinguish between deserving and undeserving poor and then recommend the best way to help them who were seen as deserving to get back on their feet. So basically, instead of giving them help, they recommended the way to get back on their feet. It rejected excessive assistance. So it wasn't a charity, it was a help group, which its founder believed would be negative. The COS conducted interviews with paupers, but in each case on its own merits and evidence received. It was seen as a scientific method which offered more organised and efficient assistance to those administering poor relief. So if anything, this was a way of undermining charity. Self-help gives the paupers more individuality, which you kind of, I mean, you do agree with and don't. You could argue that the COS were more effective in helping the paupers in charity, because this is more of a long-term concept. Now, the birth of the COS was the worry that charity was adding to paupers' dependence. So the reason the Charity Organisation Society was set up was because they were worried that the paupers were just going to basically get too much help and it wouldn't help reduce the number of paupers. The aim of the society, as we mentioned here, was to be more objective and only grant assistance to genuine cases after a detailed investigation of the claimant's circumstances. The society adopted a constructive approach and once they identified the deserving port, they would direct them into the best way of help, usually the poor law board if they needed long-term support. Now, on this basis of working on each case and using self-help, the work which developed from the 1850s onwards began to adopt a more thoughtful attitude. Now, under self-help, it was thoughtful, and I guess it was realistic in some ways. To an extent, charity can become over-reliant, especially if you are a pauper, who really is struggling. With self-help, I mean, this is another task that you can that you need to do. 
Why might you argue that the COS was a more effective means of helping paupers in charity? I mean, the one thing you can say about the COS, did they have any selfish motivation for this? You know, consider the role of women, consider the role of the middle class. Was there any selfish motives there in comparison to the COS? Possibly. So that's one thing you need to make a comparison on. Okay. Now, this is a practice response that you need to do. How far do you agree that poor relief is basically the same question we looked at last time? Write how charity and self help had a concern for the poor and how it helped their well being. Now, with this, you can actually argue both sides. You can actually say that charity did not have a concern for the well being of the poor if you want to go down that route of uh, women, ha women having a motivation, having a motive to boost their own social standing, and also the middle class not wanting to lose their gained prosperity in society. Now, homework. Um, three topics for your revision guide. I need to see this. If you've done it on paper, send me a picture. Do all lesson notes and tasks. I need to see this, same as above. And then your end of topic essay. To what extent was the Andover Workhouse scandal the main reason for improvement in the lives of the poor in the years 1832 to 1870? So the first, obviously do an introduction. That's something that I shockingly missed there. So you do an introduction. Reasons why the Andover scandal was important in changing the lives of the poor. Aim for three sections on this. Other reasons, individuals, middle class, charity, self-help, weakness of the Amendment Act. This also links to next lesson. So the next video you watch on individuals, you can also include. Now these will be printed, marked and scanned back to you. So make sure that it's gone to the top of your address so that we can get to really develop this. So just going back to the initial learning outcomes. Have we ticked the boxes? Personally, think we've got there. We know what self-help and charity means. Charity, you get self-help, you help yourself. Explain the trend grew. So how did those two things grow in this period? And how much did life change for the poor in the years 1840 to 1875? The only way to really judge that now, it was getting there. Okay, it wasn't going to change straight away, but it was definitely getting there. 